Um, the sim simple way to describe Chief Information Officer at a bank is it's my fault. Um, everyone puts it that way because uh, it's becoming more and more. I think banking's becoming like a you know a public utility in some ways in terms of it. It's you expect it, but when it's not working, you're not happy. So for example, if you can't do your mobile banking on your phone, it's it's a big moment. Whereas five, ten years ago, it wasn't a big issue. Um, so I, I look after the technology at Westpac, which is a, is a major part of a, of a large bank's business. You know, we spend a couple of billion dollars a year on technology, and uh, um, we process literally a few thousand transactions uh, a minute. Um, wow. So it's, 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 it's busy. OK, so it's a very big job. Two billion dollars a year spent on, on uh, technology. I wish uh, ANU would uh, spend something like that. Um, so tell us in terms of when you look out at the world, Dave, and uh, I guess the, the, the kind of world of information and, and the economy, um, we've been talking very much in terms of policy and high politics this morning and a bit of high economics, but when you look out at your world, the information economy, what, may, what are you most optimistic about and what are you most pessimistic about? Oh, that's a great question. I, I'm both, so it's a really good question. I'm happy to, to answer both. Um, I'll start with the pessimistic because it's always better to talk about the optimistic, so I'll move to that. I, I think and I had the pleasure of sitting on the previous session, just hearing people talk about where we are in terms of geopolitical change, economic change, the environment we're in. I think the one that was left out of that conversation is we're in massive disruption as well. Technology is disrupting our world in a manner we've never seen it before. We are in a digital revolution. And I think that is a change that's coming faster than people are ready for, and it's a change that's not going to slow down. People always talk about waves and it slows down. In my mind, technology is not slowing down. It's going to continue exponential, and we are not prepared for that. So if I would be pessimistic as Australia moves from a resources economy to more of a service economy, yep. but actually a digital-based services com economy, I think we're still playing catch-up. Um, I think we, we now talk openly about things like STEM. A year ago, we didn't talk about STEM. Other countries have been talking STEM for five to 10 years. So if I were being pessimistic, I would say we are, we are underprepared for the digital revolution we live in, and we are paying catch up. Now, we are chasing hard, and we've always been a very smart country, so I think we can catch up, but we are chasing. Now, if I wanted to be optimistic, it's part of what I just said in terms of we've always been a smart country. I, you know, I always get excited when I spend time, you know, at universities or with, you know, people from the, the Westpac Bicentennial Foundation, the scholars. Um, just the, the bright minds we have in this country, if applied to the problem, would be fantastic. So I'm optimistic there. I think one of our problems is the world has been used to working in hierarchical structures. They were the business models of previous years, and, you know, my generation is very comfortable with, with hierarchy. Um, yeah, it's good when you're defined as the boss because you understand how that works. And we have that in so many different ways. And I think some of the previous commentary might actually reflect some of that as well when you're talking about inter-country type relations as well. The, the newer generations have grown up in a digitally connected world. And so I think that concept of network is rapidly clashing with hierarchy. And, and I think will prevail over hierarchy. And we're going through that transition at the moment. I'm actually very hopeful about what that will mean, and I'm very positive about what that will mean, and it's an exciting time. So to your question, we better hurry up. We are hurrying up, and if we get it right, we have some of the best minds in the world, and I, I can't wait to see what they can do for us. Yeah. I just, I, I guess I, I, in reflecting on what you were talking about, I, I sort of was thinking about my travels through the Asia Pacific, and it seems to me that so many of the societies um, around Australia seem to be so much more advanced in terms of their use of information yep. technology than we are. You know, the, the, the rate and, and the frequency at which they use mobile telephony and, and do all sorts of things on their mobile telephones mm -hmm. seems to well outstrip Australia, even at, you know, our, our younger generation. Are we going to start, or are we already at the, at the point of actually needing to learn from the societies around us about what our future is? That's a, that's a great set of questions in there. I, I think we are we are have always been at the forefront of digital adoption. We we use technology a lot. We are not as where we need to be and how we develop on that. And also where we put it in our priorities is is 
in a, in a lower space in other parts of the world. I mean, in Southeast Asia, I was talking to, to Nick Farrelly before. In Southeast Asia, you know, the statistics there, are people will spend 10% of their, of their disposable income on a mobile phone. That's the importance of being connected. Now, the concept of an Australian spending 10% of their disposable income on just a phone is like, we wouldn't do it. We don't have it at that level of terms of how we think. Um, I, you know, I, I have three children. My daughter's a 15-year-old, goes to school, and, and everything's bring your own device. Everything's interconnected. And I say, how many of your fellow classmates are studying technology? And you get an answer of nearly zero. So you have this massive use of technology, but not this interest in actually growing the skills in it. And it's that mismatch, I think, is where we are likely to fall behind. Some of the greatest developments going on in the world right now are in third world type countries where what digital technology and connectivity is brought to them is actually creating great advancement and they're actually bringing those two together whereas we've still got a little bit of a split in there from where I sit. Okay. Now I'm going to sound like a real old fogey in asking this question, Dave, but it seems to me that we are in a situation in which we are trusting uh, these platforms and these networks more and more yep. with more and more of the vital information that we need in our personal lives but actually more and more of what keeps our societies running and ticking yep. over and together. Are we making ourselves more and more vulnerable to something going horrendously wrong or to being exploited? Yeah. Uh, the short answer to that has to be yes, unfortunately. Um, to the point I made earlier, we, we have no choice. This is this technology is here and getting faster, so it's not like we can stop it. It's, it's here. One of the downsides of being digital and interconnected is more and more of who and what you are is now in a space that is actually connected. And that comes with an enormous upside in terms of just how easy life has become. But on the flip side, you know, in my team, for example, we support literally hundreds of our customers every month who've lost their digital identity. Not for anything to do with the banking, but because they bank with us, we help them. And if you actually lose your digital identity, to actually go back and recreate that is, is very difficult. Yeah. In the world of cyber crime and cyber security, which is a massive challenge for everybody, um, the bad guys are ahead of the good guys right now. Um, and that comes with its challenges. There's a lot of uh, things in the media today about some of the cyber challenges in this country. Um, we continually have to be vigilant in that space. But in my mind, the option isn't stop or slow down or, or stop the interconnectivity, that is impossible to do. It's recognise that and do more about it. Um, we need to get a better framework and conversation within the country about educating the country about what that means. Yep. Actually, um, you know, we chose to get serious about drink driving. We put in a point zero five, and we, but we also put in a massive campaign of, of education and we saw a huge impact as a result of that. Now, I'm not saying that's the same thing you need with cyber, but you need something to actually better educate society as the world we now live in, because it's not going away. And it is a massive impact on both you as a person, but also you as a business, or as a, as a country in terms of your IP, mm. if you don't protect it. And it's a whole different threat than we've been used to in the past. Yeah, I saw a figure not so long ago that uh, showed just how many people's password for their computer is password. password. Yeah. So, uh, ladies and gents, I'd like to bring you into the conversation if and when you're ready and, and, and when you've had enough to eat. But I guess um, my question is, you know, is there in your mind a bit of a tipping point? Is there a data breach out there in the future somewhere that is likely to be so large, so kind of devastating to people's personal uh, information that will actually break down the trust? I mean, essentially, these are not only technological yeah. platforms, they are trust. You yeah. know? And what makes your business able to function in the way it does is people trusting you to yeah. keep their information safe. You could argue we've already had a few. Um, and again, this is a difficult question as well to answer as a 51-year-old, as a which I am, in terms of my view of what I'm willing to share and what my... 15 year old is willing to share is, is very different. Um, I, I think we are seeing more and more, and the challenge with cyber security in the past, just for a moment, is we typically have crime that is, you know, gangsters or criminals, and we have the, the local neighborhood things, and we have things going on between governments. In the cyberspace, that's all interconnected. Um, and so 
the technology is being developed by nation states and now being leveraged by the cyber criminals and then being leveraged by the hacktivists and other people who want to use it. Those three are now blending, which means also not only are the threats they're bringing to bear blending, but the information they receive and the crimes they commit are now blending as well. So it's not just a matter of, you know, you lost your password and therefore someone could put a, a crypto locker on your PC and you've got to pay money to, to get your photographs back. But suddenly your information is in the dark web and moving around the world and being used for all sorts of other things. And suddenly your identity is being used for something else and the other things go. So to answer your question, I think we are going to see some events where people realize it's not someone stole my money. It's someone stole who I was and used me for something else and that's done at scale. I think when that becomes more into the, okay. the conversation, that will be a, a, an interesting moment for us as to how do we deal with that as a society and as an economy. So could we see, I mean, I know there are some countries, for example, that have much lower rates of internet banking than we do yeah. because the trust isn't there. The trust, something has happened or something has not happened that people will put their trust in. Could we see some stage in the future Australia pulling back from being that kind of digitally engaged society that we are moving towards? Um, personally, I don't. Um, I'm the CIO at a major bank. We take that incredibly seriously. I think the banks in Australia are as well prepared as they could be in the current environment. Where I think the challenge is, is that the next layers of business and into the personal realm, realm we're, we're underprepared. Okay. And getting a far more common view on this, I think, is more important than a particular you know, dial up or dial down in, in one industry. And that ability to communicate between industry, government, academia and others, I think is an interesting topic more broadly than the cyberspace. But in the cyberspace, having a far more, you know, for want of a better word, secure Australia point of view, I, I think is important in that conversation. So I don't think we'd be stepping away from, say, banking or internet banking, as I say, I think it's more bringing the rest of where we are to the same level um, in terms of how we do. Um, you know, I imagine most people in this room use mobile and internet banking. It's become the norm. But similarly, they use Facebook and they use um, all the other social tools that are available to them. It's in those areas there that you have to consider where the other things come together in a broader risk. So I, I don't see us stepping away. My view is the convenience it brings will continue to see it being adopted, it comes with risks and we have to actually step up to those risks. And how are we doing? I mean, I know that the government has um, instituted a, a range of um, sort of govern mm. government industry working groups and linkages. Is that working as well as it could be? Does, does more need to be done? How should we be thinking about the future of our cyber security yeah. policy? I, I think more needs to be done across the board in the digital space and definitely in the, in the cyberspace. To my comment earlier, I think we're in, we're in, in catch up mode. If you look at other countries around the world, that conversation between government, business, academia, and in some cases military, um, is far more open and collaborative to the benefit of the, of the country. Uh, we, we struggle in those conversations. Um, we're getting better, um, but we need to do more. Um, cyber is one of those spaces. We still have a, have a almost a one-way dialogue between industry and, and, and government on the basis that you, you know, it's, it's security, you've got to protect it. Um, well, the security threat is now far larger because you, know, you, know, you have the, the nation state, the criminals and the hacktivists all coming together, so you can't use the same defence against it. Um, you see other countries, uh, you know, Singapore and Southeast Asia are a good example. Israel is an extraordinary example, but even the UK the things that are happening in the UK are far more collaborative in that space. And I think we, we can do that better. Uh, I think the other comment about, you know, we need to be better at producing talent in this space drives the same co conversation. Yep. Um, you know, I, I have a, a frustration that if I look in the academic world, the lack of cyber security postgraduate and undergraduate type courses is, is at best nascent. Um, you know, last time, the latest, Data suggested we're, we're a million professionals short in the technology wow. world globally. Um, um, now, if that's not an area where you want to build skills quickly, I can't think of a better one. Um, we need to be quicker at catching up and chasing those things as they happen because we don't have a 20-year uh, 
you know, advanced warning like we used to have on technologies. They are, um, they are here and, t and here today. Um, artificial intelligence has been talked about since, you know, Isaac Asimov right. used to write books. Yep. Yep. Um, it arrived in the last year. Um, and yet we're still thinking artificial intelligence is science fiction. It has arrived mm. and we are talking about it. Um, so that's just another example. So getting into the culture of it, Dave, you've just been to Israel. What is it that the Israelis or the Singaporeans have that we don't have? Why are, why are we not capable of leapfrogging yeah. into this and being at, at the leading edge? Uh, that's a really hard question. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a technologist, so I've got to be careful how I answer that. But I, my, my personal view is that they have a view of what they want to be or what they need to be. We're in a transition state as a, as a nation. We were very much driven by a resources sector. We're moving more to a, a services sector. We don't really know what that looks like, okay. um, which makes it a very difficult place to be. Um, what I've heard today in a lot of the conversations is a lot of hope, a lot of excitement, and a lot of uncertainty. Yep. And I think it's that uncertainty of what does it look like it makes it difficult. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you turn up to some of these smaller countries, but frankly in terms of population and GDP, not that much smaller, um, they have a very clear view of, of what they want to be and, and how they're going to bring their resources together to compete. Yep. And we are a little bit more open than that, which personally, you know, politically, is probably a very good thing, but it comes at a, at a price in terms of coordination yep. and, and how you want to compete. And in a world that's changing faster than you know, and that competition is becoming more uncertain, that, that gives us um, some challenges. It strikes me that, it, that the kind of ongoing political bun fight over the NBN is a, is a good metaphor, yeah, a great metaphor for our inability as a country yeah. to take this stuff yeah. particularly yeah. seriously. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great metaphor, and I'll stay away from the politics of the NBN, but the technology of the NBN was, it was a great technology for a piece of time, which means if you rolled it out really quickly, it would be very effective. Where we sit today, we know we haven't rolled it out really effectively, and therefore you have all the issues that go with that, and I won't comment on those. But I would comment that if rolled out really quickly, it was a technology that at a point of time that would have given us a great step up. Uh, we're now in a bit more of an uncertain space with it. Um, I think that's true of all the technologies we talk about. Um, you know, I talk with my team, and, and one of the disadvantages of working in a large bank like a Westpac, no matter what we start, it will be out of date before we finish. That's a mindset shift that is very difficult to make for Absolutely. someone that grew up in a world where you put something in and you had 20 years of value out of it. It will be out of date before we've implemented it. And you have to change completely how you think and how you work. And you know, structures I mentioned of hierarchy struggle with it's out of date before you start. And that, when you then come into you know, uh, academia, I'm going to create a new course, well, it's out of date before the first set of graduates have actually been employed. Um, how do you bring that together? So that's, I think, one of the great challenges Absolutely. we face. Ladies and gentlemen, are there any questions that people would like to ask? David. Uh, Mr. Carr, I wonder, I wonder uh, David Goyne, uh, there must be, I think, three dimensions to your work, sort of a outwards focus to customers, an inwards focus connecting the bank, and then a focus connecting to the other banks and the global financial system. What's your relative importance between those, and has that changed? Oh, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, can I spin it around a bit and see if I can answer it for you? I, I break it into three things. One is the things I need to do to keep the banking sector secure and stable. So that's things like the cybersecurity work, working with the regulators, um, ensuring the systems are working. Um, if, you know, any of the Australian banks stop working tomorrow and the UK Royal Bank of Scotland was off the air for a week. If, you know, that has massive impact on an economy. That would be about a third of my job just doing that. There's then about a third of your job which is the things you need to do to compete. And you compete every day um, to serve your customers and win their trust. Um, and there's, in the world we live in with all the things changing, for example, if my mobile banking site hasn't got the features expected that someone else has, then I'm out of that competition. So about a third there. And then about a third is more the outward looking to your question in terms of where's the world going and what are the investments we need to make to be pertinent in 10 and 20 years' time? Because in a large organisation, they take five to 10 years to do 
and you have to be across what's happening. Now, in the past, that was reasonably easy. You put your head up once every year or two, you had a look, and you went, yes, we're about on track. Where we are now and why I was in Israel two weeks ago in the UK, I'm in San Francisco the week after next, is you need to have your head up a lot more because what you thought was going to be the change and how it was going to land is, is changing all the time. Um, you know, the great example I was given in San Francisco last time I was there was one of the investors in Uber. Wouldn't we all like to be one of the investors in Uber? Um, when he first looked at Uber, they were talking about a $340 million taxi industry in, Sa in San Francisco. And he thought if we could get a third of that, and you do that in 10 cities, pretty good investment. The Uber market in San Francisco is now over a billion dollars. So rather than getting a third of the industry, they tripled the industry. Those kind of changes, what you expected to happen, is not happening. Uh, and so being on top of that. So about a third of my job is that outward looking. So in my mind, it's keep the bank safe, and all the things that go with that, and the industry goes with it. Make sure we're competitive in that space but also make sure we're relevant as the, as the world goes forward. Um, that's how I'd split the three. So it's a little bit of a different answer to how you structure, but I'll hopefully... Uh. Yeah, just here. Oh, sorry, Julia, to the gentleman there with the scarf. Yep. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. Oh, thank you. My first question is, what do you think is the next big thing in banking? And... My second question is, is there anything great left to do for young entrepreneurs today? <laughs> because like, a lot of people complain to me that you know, everything's been done like this. Like, no. okay, it's not, I know it's not, but yeah. uh, normally if you want to open a bank these days. Yeah. But, so what are your answers? So I think, I remember I'm the CIO at a bank. I'm not um, one of the other roles, so I'll just preface it with that. I, I think in banking is, Disruption is changing all industries. The more regulated industries are not being disrupted as quickly as some of the others. So if you know, I was in the newspaper game, I would be in a you know, very disrupted model. Uh, what we're seeing more and more is the innovators and the startups and industry, rather than coming head to head, are coming more together because they're recognizing the value and the two working together. So what I think we're going to see the next big thing in banking is banking and all these other things becoming more intertwined. Um, you know, we talk about it within, within Westpac, but I know this is common in many banks. You know, 20 years ago, we sold mortgages. Now it's about home ownership. How do you help a customer get into a home and what does that mean? Now, I think that's a really positive thing because it's actually talking about the customer's need rather than what I want to sell. And again, it's a bit going from like the, the sales world to a, a services world. So I think the next big thing in banking is genuinely becoming a service that is interconnected in the world we live in and it's keeping up with all the things that are going on. I think that's it. It's going to be driven by cloud technology and artificial intelligence and other things. Um, but I think as an end customer, is your bank is going to be less where you go to buy a product as opposed to it's a service that lives in your world and makes your needs at those points when you need it. And I think that's the next big thing. And I think it's pretty exciting if, when we can get there because in my mind, that's what banking is all about, providing a service and how you do that. To your second question, um, the answer is yes, and if I could give you an example, I wouldn't be sitting here, I'd be off working on it. Um, I, I've got a bunch of ideas. Um, I, I took three of my board members to Israel recently. We went to look at cyber technology because it's one of the, the, the global hubs in that space. But we also a bit of, spent a bit of time talking to startups. We met five startups in one morning. And out of those five, if I could, which I can't, I would have invested in all five because every one of them blew my my mind away about how smart are they, and three of them we will be doing business with within 12 months. Um, now that's just five in one morning. Um, there are so many opportunities. Um, the challenge is how do you bring the technology and the opportunity together quickly to bring it to need as quickly as you can do, but there's so many opportunities. Michael. Um, Coming, um, everyone's obviously seen it. There's starting to be some scenarios where you have um, these big tech companies like Google, yeah. Facebook, Apple, all yeah. these companies are, um, are starting to, I guess, butt heads a little bit with um, governments and, and even some yeah. banking institutions. I mean, we've had, um, obviously, there's the current ongoing situation with uh, Commonwealth Westpac and NAB with the Apple Pay yeah. access. Um, then there was, Queensland government's been a bit up and down with um, 
yep. Uber's illegal, then it's legal, then it's yep. legal. And, um, and then obviously the big one was um, the open letter from Apple uh, telling the, the US government that they wouldn't give them a backdoor into their phones. Yeah. So I'm really interested to know what your thoughts are on how that relationship is going to play out in the future. Because I mean, if you if you look at it, people probably realistically trust Google more with their information than they do sort of their own government in the sense, yeah. in a way. So just interested what you think in that relationship moving forward. It's an extraordinary difficult question to answer. Um, it's interesting, your last point is almost the most interesting challenge is people do seem to trust Google more with their information. They have more information than anybody else. Why? I can't answer why. Um, you know, um, the conversation around Apple Pay at the moment is live <laughs> right now in banking in Australia and well, well publicised. Um, straight away, and I'm obviously biased, so I'll be careful how I answer this. Um, straight away, people go to, well, Apple must be right um, without understanding where it sits. Um, we're in an interesting space. Um, the the money of the new economy, the value of the new economy is data. Um, and data is becoming people's biggest assets, back to the cyber conversation, the identity conversation. But also it's becoming the, um, the connector of the world and it's also the, the value shifts in the world. Um, those who have the most data are in a very, very strong position. How they use that, we will wait and see. You've already seen a number of times and you mentioned one where a very large tech company has pushed back on the US government. We will see more. We already have numerous situations where um, large pools of data with intelligence applied to them have insights in society we didn't expect. Um, it was you know, nearly a decade ago where Tesco's were predicting you know, when people were pregnant. Um, that caused all sorts of societal issues as a result of that. There are far more examples of that every day. Um, I'm dodging your question a little because I don't know the answer. What I do know is consolidation is happening more and more. Um, the more startups and others are being successful, the more they're being bought. So that group of companies is growing, and they're growing very quickly. Um, their combined GDP, if you measure it in GDP, is more than most countries. Um, they are a political force in their own right. Um, we still haven't worked out what that means. I don't know, but from where I sit, I can see it. These are enormously... Um, powerful institutions with an enormous amount of information. Mm -hmm. I work with most of them. Uh, it's part of my job. Um, most of the time that's very positive. Some of the times we butt heads. What it does though tell you that data has become very much the, uh, the main thing in the new economy and we're still trying to work out what that means. Thank you, Dave, for uh, sharing your thoughts. Uh, it's most interesting. I'm trying to work out what a stable future looks like, though, mm. is that you mentioned that technology is out of date before you start, which I think was mean you were meaning that you're actually very sympathetic to NBN's problem. <laughs> you didn't quite connect that. But when we look at Moore's law and see how rapidly technology moves, we've got one element going like that. When we look at policy in an area that I'm sympathetic to, policy it will always be playing catch up to the technology. It's not really possible for the policy to be able to get ahead when technology is moving at such a pace. But one of the reasons policy is not moving so fast is I think that our cultural norms and attitudes move even slower. And so when we've got cultural attitudes about acceptability of privacy, cultural at attitudes about, but I like to deal with a person, and, and things like that, that pulls policy to a slower speed. How do we ever discover a stable place between what technology could offer, what policy can respond to and deliver, and in a slower moving culture? It's almost an impossible question, which I think is part of what you were saying. Um, I do have simply to MBN, by the way. Um, to roll up something that large in the unstable political environment we've had for the last five years, I, I, I feel for them. Um, the answer I would give you, and I don't know enough, none of us do, but the answer I would give you is 
policy, like so many other things for those of us our generation, has worked very well in that kind of hierarchical type structure. We are moving to a network structure. In fact, most of society has already moved to a network st structure. If you move to Southeast Asia in those, and you know, many of those villages in the hills um, are connected in a way that is changing immediately because of what we've done with technology. It's that piece there where I think we're going to find that's going to be the new norm. Uh, we saw it with Uber. Um, you know, Uber went into cities where most places it was illegal. What did we do? We changed the laws. We didn't remove Uber. Um, we're going to see more and more of that. And I think there's a generation already in our country that are very comfortable working in that manner. Um, there is a generation that currently sets the policy, sets the thinking, runs the companies that is less com comfortable. Um, we're in that transition period. Um, my mind is, people talk about, and I'm not an expert in this space, I'll be very careful. Um, in my mind, babies didn't start coming out differently. So, you know, millennials, the only difference for them than baby boomers is the generation they grew up in, and one of the biggest changes there, apart from the economic and geopolitical space, is the technology space they grew up in. And the fact that millennials are so comfortable networked is because of the technology, not because they came out differently. And in my mind, what I think will happen to your question is the new norm is we'll break down hierarchy and move to network, but we don't know what that looks like yet. And particularly like people like you and me, that's a real challenge because our entire way of thinking is anchored in that. And we're seeing that in so many, so many different ways right now. Um, and it's a transition, we don't know what it looks like. I don't think the technology is going to slow down, but that part of the technology is producing a massive, massive shift in the world we live in. That's my simple view on it. Yeah, Brittany. Um, my question's about virtual currency. How do you see virtual currency, such as Bitcoin and beyond, um, having an influence on the banking industry coming into the future? That could be a 20 minute question on its own. I'll try, and, I'll try and break it down to a few things if I could. Firstly, um, I see no real difference between virtual currency and real currency. Um, the challenge people have had with Bitcoin is how do you get them and how do you sell them? So what people call on-ramps and off-ramps, and that's still a struggle. I, I actually think the currency of the new economy is going to be data. So whether it's whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, where the challenge is is then how do you manage that? Um, it's no longer bullion in a bank that's converted to something. It's a whole different uh, space. People talk about blockchain. I think blockchain is a really interesting set of conversations. Everyone thought Bitcoin and blockchain were connected. They're not. What does that mean in terms of creating a distributed ledger? Um, and how does that work in an economy? It has a really interesting set. But then you had the hack of the, the Hong Kong exchange only uh, a month or so ago. Um, so there's still the questions around security to be dealt in that space. So in my mind, um, digital currency is definitely going to happen in different forms. In my mind, though, the concept of currency is going to get broader and broader. So we're going to go from physical currency to digital currency to actually what does the value of my data start meaning and how do I actually equate for that? How do I measure that? Um, that's going to be the bigger challenge. So mm, definitely digital currency within the next few years. I mean, it's here now, but within the next few years at scale. Um, but then how do you manage that and what does that unlock? And I think that's the real challenge. Uh, and then the example I used for people recently, most people in the room probably remember Napster. People remember Napster. We all thought it was a pretty cool technology and it was a pretty cool technology, but it didn't actually go anywhere. And then suddenly someone went, oh, iTunes and music and iPods, and suddenly a whole industry was changed, but the technology had kind of been there for a little while in different forms. I think Bitcoin and um, undercurring blockchain and other type of things are a bit like Napster, really, really cool, but still got too many flaws to actually really take off. Somewhere, someone will either solve the problem or recognize the solution is to a different problem. Probably the latter, uh, and someone's gonna wake up tomorrow and go, whatever that is, Good luck if you're on that one. Um, um, and that's going to change dramatically. And I wish I knew what that one was, because again, I wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be working somewhere uh, very hard on that right now. And kind of in linking that then is where do you see Australia banking is their, their position in that? 
Oh, that's a good question. Um, and again, you know, obviously I'm biased. I work for an Australian large bank. We have, we are extraordinarily lucky. I think I got the, I think I got the best job in the world, apart from my systems break and everyone beats me up. But I think I got the best job in the world. Why? Um, the Australian banks, like other well-regulated, managed countries, be it you know Singapore, Canada, for two other examples. Um, came through the GFC, as did the country, in, in good shape. So you've got, a, you've got a vibrant banking environment. You're in a country that has high digital take-up and high um, technology um, use. And I think, importantly as well, our banks are big enough to be able to do things, but small enough to be able to do things. So, for example, if you go to America right now, you are still very much in these siloed banking. You've got your savings account, you've got your mortgage, and they're very separate things, whereas Australians are very used to being able to connect in all sorts of different ways. You go on the internet, you can call a call centre, you can go to a branch, you can look at your mortgage, you can look at your term deposit, you can look at your wealth management. That in the back, what we think is quite normal in most countries is extraordinarily advanced. So to have that at scale in an environment where you still have a, a strong economy and a strong banking system puts us at the forefront of what's going on, which is part of where I get my frustration on is, you know, we need more bright, capable people working in these spaces rather than heading off to Silicon Valley or somewhere else because we've got a great opportunity if we want to go after it. So, you know, I'll be beating the drum as hard and loud as I can that, um, you know, we should be leading the world in these things and continue to do so. Uh, thanks, Dave. Um, I'm all about turning um, you know, consumers of technology into creators of technology, so I love that idea. Um, but with all these opportunities that technology um, has for Australians, how do we ensure that technology is used to, uh, to, to... We leverage technology to solve some of our biggest, biggest problems, particularly for our generation rising inequality around the world, um, rather than reinforcing um, inequality that exists in our world? Yeah. I think the answer like, to many of these is education. I think it's education. Um, you know, why in the last 10 years has Australia doubled the number of lawyers and half the number of technology graduates? I can't get my head around that at all. Um, it applies to so many other things. In my mind, it's education. Cyber security, it's education. How do we understand what these things mean? Um, what does interconnectivity mean and how do we leverage it? I think the whole thing is education and quality of conversation. Now, it's one of the things why I think sessions like these are so important, people talking about it. Uh, I think the more we talk about it, the we more we educate ourselves, um, putting our head in the sand and hoping it'll go away. To my opening comments, I don't think that's a possibility. I think it's, it's here, so educating ourselves and doing our best with something that we don't fully understand and have to accept we will never fully understand because it's just going to keep coming so fast. Then it has to be in the education space. And I'm not now talking about academia. I'm talking about the genuine, broader sense of education as a society. Um, we've, we've been talking about startups and no industries. Do you see a role for failure in actually making advances? Oh, yes. Um, that's another, you know, societal challenge. We, we use the word failure because we think, think of everything as a project, as a thing, and it fails. Uh, I think one of the big shifts we've seen in technology is going away from the large, you know, so-called waterfall project and you know, I'm a bank, I have many. You know, everything takes six months and costs you know, X million dollars. And if it doesn't work, it's a failure. Being able to, to, to learn quickly is so important. You know, the term fail fast um, is becoming more and more positive. I, I don't like it because the world fail in it. Um, learn fast, I think, is a much better thing. So we have too much of this, you succeeded or you failed. That works when you're in a kind of sequential world, when you're in this massive parallel change? I, I, short answer is yes, but I wouldn't call it failure. It's how do you learn quickly? How do you test? Why do you have to be an expert? Um, if, the, if the change is coming so fast, you can't be an expert, but yet we still have to be an expert because that supports us in a hierarchical world. My expertise is my value. Um, as soon as you can give away that and recognize I can continue to learn, and the way I learn is either being taught or by testing and learning. Um, that's so important. So in my mind, test and learn is critical. And if something didn't work, that's not a failure. That's learning. So yes, but I wouldn't call it a failure, if that makes sense, it, provided I can do it quickly. Just here in the front. 
Hi, I'm Alison. Hi. I have a bit of a devil's advocate question. So when studying cities, we look at what makes a city innovative. And there's a strong <coughs> correlation between face-to-face -face time. Yeah. And with technology, we're seeing more people work from home, more people studying yeah. at home or abroad, and people getting less face-to-face -face time, especially on public transport when everyone's looking at their phones. So yeah. in a sense, could all our innovating and technological development in a sense, lead to less innovation further in the future? Oh, that's a, <laughs> that's a tough question. Um, how I would try and answer that is I, I think people make the mistake mm. of thinking technology is going to replace humans. Uh, and if that happens, it's going to be a very sad day for all of us. I, I actually think what we're seeing is technology is augmenting human intelligence. And it used to be technology created the, the tractor that replaced the work manual labour on the land, but it was an augmentation. We're in exactly the same space with intelligence in terms of technology and augmenting. So I, I see it in my teams as well. I, I have flexible work conditions in my team, I have people working from home, etc. That works well, but when you go to 100% of it, you lose that connectivity and we don't work well that way. Now you try and replace that with other things, you know, your internal social media networks, we use Net Yammer. Um, you use Skype and use all the other things, but unless you bring people together quite regularly, you do lose that, that dynamic that brings so much more than you can do. So I, I think we're going to see continually technology better augmenting how we work, and as long as we think that way, we'll get the value out of it. When we expect it to replace it, I think we are going to be challenged. Um, you know, people talk about artificial intelligence and cognitive computing. You know, that has to be in an augmentation space. Um, it can't be just let it run. Um, and I think that same, in, you know, so I, I'm no expert in the areas you spoke of, but I do see where you have large, you know, I, I have large teams in India. I have uh, very large teams in India. Those teams work much better if a few people every now and again get on a plane and go and spend time with each other. We do all the stand-up meetings, we do all the interconnectivity, we do all the smart board stuff, all the things you'd expect as a technology organisation. Um, but unless you get the people together, you miss that spark and you miss that connectivity. Um, people still trust people they really know rather than someone they've just spoken to. And I think that's really important. Okay, last question over this side. Thank you, Dave. Um, very interesting what you were saying before about uh, about having the sympathy for the uh, for the MBN uh, and the the difficulty of, of chasing a very large infrastructure project that necessarily is so large that it's probably going to be out of date before it is is completed. So, in your area, how how do you actually cope with that level of, uh, of rate of change? How do you how do you anticipate where the future is going to? Do you do you use a range of different scenario based um, propositions or experimentation, how do you keep away the, uh, the, the circumstances of, of, of investing in something which is uh, yesterday's technology? So two quick answers to that. First, um, speed has become more important than it ever was before. So most organisations, when projects are running, scope is more important than, than schedule. Scope and budget. How much money have I got and what do I want to do? Because um, that typically translates to where the the hierarchy works and where the, put, the importance sits. You know, I want something, therefore that's my scope and I've got money for it. And therefore I'll let it run longer till I get what I want or things go with it. In the new world, actually, schedule is far more important. I've got to deliver it. And if I don't deliver everything I said I was going to deliver, actually that's not as important as taking longer to deliver everything I said. You've got to change how you work. I, th I think the second one is, in an interconnected world, the more you can disconnect the things in your organisation so they can reconnect rapidly, that's going to be more and more important. People talk about the API economy and how you use APIs, application program interfaces. You know, banking, a great example. A large part of banking hasn't changed um, since whenever. Um, you know, personally, I can't think of a new product in banking for decades. I can see lots of new, feels like new products, but I brought them together, like a, um, a mortgage offset. Um, but all I did there was take two types of things together. So the more that organisations can expose their capability, both internally and externally, in a manner that can be connected rapidly, that will allow you to keep up. 
Because whilst the world's changing really fast, some of it's actually just there, and you need it just to keep working. And be able to break those apart so you can reconnect them really quickly is really important. So in my mind, it's, it's don't build everything as one big connected thing, and if you've got one of those, start breaking it up into manners where you can work within the organisation. I'm talking technology here, I'm not talking um, anything beyond that. Um, and then speed, it's all about speed and learning to make mistakes along the way and going, I don't know how that's going to work when I plug these two things together, but it might, but it might work. Um, and you know, we all talk about the examples like the Ubers and how they worked. For every Uber, there was 500 that didn't work. You want to get through those really quickly. And the way you do that is actually at my point of where technology brings organisations and innovation together rather than head to head. And I think that's the world. How do you do it fast? How do you learn fast? And how do you actually bring things together is actually what the new world's all about. Well, Dave, uh, we've run out of time in an incredibly rich conversation. I guess you could say I'm scared but exhilarated. <laughs> That's right. Um, hopefully the rest of our audience are as well. Ladies and gentlemen, could you please join with me in thanking Dave Curran? Yeah.